Good morning, everybody. I just had my coffee and I am ready to go. How about you? All right, let's pick back up. This is part four. We're finishing chapter, or excuse me, module six, the cell. Let's begin on page 184. The second paragraph, it begins, you can therefore think. Okay, have you found it? Let's go. You can therefore think of what happens in the formation of acetyl coenzyme A this way. Each pyruvic acid molecule loses a carbon, two oxygens, and a hydrogen. The carbon and oxygen atoms become CO2, and the hydrogen atom is a product in the reaction. In order for this to happen, however, a large molecule called coenzyme A had to be added to the pyruvic acid. Eventually, that molecule will leave the picture, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Once the acetyl coenzyme A is formed, the next stage, called the Krebs cycle, begins. This stage is sometimes called the citric acid cycle, and it also takes place in the mitochondrion. It takes the two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A and reacts them with oxygen to make hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and coenzyme A again. This is actually a long, complicated procedure that involves many reactions, which are carefully controlled by enzymes. The overall chemical reaction that occurs as a result of this process, however, is fairly simple. Notice what happens here. The two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A that were produced in the previous step are reacted with oxygen to make hydrogen atoms, carbon dioxides, and coenzyme A's. This reaction also produces some energy. Now, think about what has happened so far. We originally had a molecule of glucose, which has six carbon atoms, six oxygen atoms, and 12 hydrogen atoms. From glycolysis to the end of the Krebs cycle, the glucose molecule has been broken down. The carbon chain has been destroyed and the six carbons that were part of that chain are now a part of six individual carbon dioxide molecules. Two of those carbon dioxide molecules were formed in the formation of acetyl coenzyme A, the second stage and four of them were formed in the Krebs cycle, the third stage. Half of the oxygens needed to form those carbon dioxide molecules came from the glucose molecule itself, and the other half came from oxygen that was added during the Krebs cycle. Thus, the carbons, and oxygens in the glucose molecule have all been accounted for. So far, the only thing that has been actually added to the glucose is the three oxygen molecules that were a part of the Krebs cycle, the third stage. You might think that coenzyme A was added as well, but it really wasn't. After all, the formation of acetyl coenzyme A, the second stage, required the addition of two molecules of coenzyme A. But what happened at the end of the Krebs cycle? Two molecules of coenzyme A were produced. Thus, the second stage used two molecules of coenzyme A 
but the third stage produced two molecules of coenzyme A. The net effect then is that the amount of coenzyme A never changes. It is just used and then remade over and over again. Ah. All right then. So far, the glucose molecule has been broken down into six carbon dioxide molecules and 12 hydrogen atoms. In order to accomplish this, three molecules of oxygen were used. What's left? Well, the last stage of cellular respiration is called the electron transport system. This stage produces the most energy of all four stages. Just like the Krebs cycle, it takes place in the mitochondrion. In this stage, the hydrogen that was produced in the previous three stages is carefully reacted with oxygen to make water. Now, think about it. Glycolysis produces four hydrogen atoms. The formation of acetyl coenzyme A produces two more. And the Krebs cycle produces six hydrogen atoms. How many total do we have now? We have all 12 hydrogens that were originally in the glucose molecule. They react with three oxygen molecules to make water. <laughs> Once again, like the Krebs cycle, this is actually done through a complicated series of enzyme controlled reactions. We've gone through a lot of information here and your head might be swimming with all of the new information. As a result, we wanna step back and summarize what you have learned so far. In the first stage of aerobic cellular respiration, called glycolysis, glucose is broken down into two smaller molecules, as well as four hydrogen atoms. This produces a small amount of energy. In the second stage, the formation of acetyl coenzyme A, a carbon, two oxygens, and a hydrogen are removed from each of the two molecules made in glycolysis. And two molecules of coenzyme A are attached to the remains. This results in the production of two acetyl coenzyme A molecules, two carbon dioxide molecules, and two hydrogen atoms. In the third stage, the Krebs cycle, the two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A are reacted with three oxygen molecules. This produces six hydrogen atoms four carbon dioxide molecules, two molecules of coenzyme A, and some energy. Finally, in the fourth stage, the electron transport system, the 12 hydrogen atoms that were produced in the previous three stages are reacted with three oxygen molecules to make six water molecules and a lot of energy. <laughs> okay, so what's the overall effect of these four stages? Well, we know that one molecule of glucose is used. We also know that three molecules of oxygen are used in the Krebs cycle, and another three are used in the electron transport system. As a result, a total of six oxygen molecules are used. Two molecules of coenzyme A are used in the formation of acetyl coenzyme A, but they are made again in the Krebs cycle. Thus, there is no net use or production of coenzyme A. 
what is produced then? Well, lots of things are produced, but most get used up again. All of the hydrogen atoms produced in the first three stages, for example, are used in the fourth stage, the electron transport system. All of the other products of glycolysis are used. All of the other products of the formation of acetyl coenzyme A are used except for the two carbon dioxide molecules. All of the other products of the Krebs cycle, except for the four carbon dioxide molecules, are used. Thus, a total of six carbon dioxide molecules are made. In addition, the electron transport system produces six water molecules. In addition, all stages but the second produce energy. Thus, after everything is said and done, one glucose molecule is reacted with six oxygen molecules to make six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, and energy. What is that reaction? Well, that's the reaction we showed at the beginning of this section. <laughs> In the end then, the overall chemical equation that tells us how cells get their energy is very simple. The process by which that reaction occurs, however, is incredibly complex. ATP and ADP. Now, <laughs> As if what you have learned weren't complicated enough, there is one more twist we have to add. To make things a little more complicated, the energy produced in cellular respiration must be stored so that it can be transported to different parts of the cell and used when the cell needs it. Energy can be stored in nearly any molecule. And when that molecule is broken down, the energy will be released. In a cell, however, the energy must be stored in such a way as to allow for a gentle release of energy. If the energy is not released gently enough, it will destroy a part of the cell rather than help it perform its tasks. Thus, the energy produced in cellular respiration must be stored in a molecule that, when broken down, releases only a small amount of energy. That molecule is adenosine triphosphate, which is usually abbreviated ATP. ATP is composed of a substance called adenosine, linked with three phosphate groups. When one of the phosphate groups is broken away from the rest of the molecule, a gentle release of energy occurs. This energy is sufficient to accomplish most tasks in a cell, but gentle enough so that it will not harm the cell. When the phosphate group breaks off from the rest of the molecule, an adenosine attached to two phosphate groups is left over. This molecule is called adenosine diphosphate. This reaction is usually represented as follows. ATP yields or yields ADP plus P plus energy. The products of this reaction, ADP and the lone phosphate group, P, find their way back into either the cytoplasm or a mitochondrion so that they can be reassembled into ATP to store more energy. Now, it's really important that you sit back and understand what's going on here. In three of the four stages of cellular respiration, 
energy is released. This energy cannot be transported to the parts of the cell that need it unless it is packaged in some way. It must be packaged so that it can be gently released directly in the place in which it is needed. That's the job of ATP. Thus, the energy produced in each stage of cellular respiration is used to make ATP from ADP and a phosphate group, P. The ATP is then transported to the place where energy is needed. And at that point, enzymes break the ATP down into ADP and a phosphate group. The resulting gentle release of energy is used by the cell and the ADP and phosphate are returned so that more ATP can be produced. Oh, wow. Since each stage of cellular respiration releases different amounts of energy, you might be interested to know how much energy is released in each stage. The first stage, glycolysis, actually requires two ATPs in order to get going. Thus, when a monosaccharide needs to be broken down, two ATPs are broken down. And the resulting energy released supplies the activation energy required to start glycolysis. The process of glycolysis, however, releases enough energy to make four ATP molecules from the ADP and phosphates that are in the cytoplasm. Thus, two ATPs are used in glycolysis, but four are produced for a net gain of two ATPs. Let me read that again. The process of glycolysis, however, releases enough energy to make four ATP molecules from the ADP and phosphates that are in the cytoplasm. Thus, two ATPs are used in glycolysis, but four are produced for a net gain of two ATPs. The Krebs cycle releases enough energy to produce two more ATPs from the ADP and phosphate in the mitochondrion. Finally, the electron transport system produces enough energy to make 32 ATPs from the ADP and phosphates in the mitochondrion. <laughs> Adding it all up, a single glucose molecule produces enough energy in aerobic cellular respiration to make 38 ATP molecules. The process requires two ATPs to get going, however, so the net gain is 36 ATPs. These 36 ATP molecules can then be transported to where the cell needs energy. Once there, enzymes will break a phosphate group off of the ATP, providing a gentle release of energy for the cell. To sum up, cellular respiration can be illustrated by the schematic in the figure below. We know that the figure is complex but that's because it describes a complex process. Please be patient and read our description of the figure, flipping back from time to time to look at it. First, notice that there are four bands of color in the figure. Each band denotes a stage of aerobic cellular respiration. The white band at the very bottom is the overall result of the four stage process. Let's go through each band so that you can once more review what is going on. The first band, pink, 
represents stage one, which is glycolysis. In this stage, a glucose molecule, C6, H12, O6, is broken down into two pyruvic acid molecules, 2C3, H4, O3, and four hydrogen atoms, 4H. This results in enough energy to make two ATPs. Now, notice that the pyruvic acid molecules are highlighted in yellow and the hydrogen atoms are highlighted in blue. Why? because the pyruvic acid molecules will be used in the next stage, which is represented by the yellow band, and the hydrogen atoms will be used in the final stage, which is represented by the blue band. The only product in this stage that is not used in a later stage is the energy produced. The second band, yellow, represents the formation of acetyl-coenzyme A. In this stage, the two pyruvic acid molecules that were produced in glycolysis are reacted with two coenzyme A molecules. This results in two acetyl-coenzyme A molecules, two hydrogen atoms, and two carbon dioxide molecules. No ATPs are produced in this step. Notice that the acetyl-coenzyme A molecules are highlighted in green. That's because they will be used in the next stage, which is represented by the green band. The hydrogen atoms are highlighted in blue because they will be used in the fourth stage, which is represented by the blue band. The carbon dioxide molecules are not highlighted because they are not used again. So far then, glycolysis produced two ATPs that are not used by a later stage. And this stage produced two carbon dioxide molecules that will not be used by a later stage. We could consider these the final products of the process so far. The third band, green, represents the Krebs cycle. In this stage, two acetyl-coenzyme A molecules that were formed in stage two are reacted with three oxygen molecules. This makes two coenzyme A molecules, six hydrogen atoms, four carbon dioxide molecules, and another two ATPs. Notice that the coenzyme A molecules are highlighted in yellow. That's because they will be used in stage two of a later aerobic cellular respiration process. Thus, they will be used up when another glucose undergoes aerobic respiration. The six hydrogen atoms are highlighted in blue because they are used in stage four, which is represented by the blue band. The carbon dioxide molecules and ATPs are not highlighted as they, will, they are not used again. Thus, they add to the final products we had from stages one and two. The fourth band, blue, represents the electron transport system. In this stage, the 12 hydrogen atoms that have been made so far four from stage one, two from stage two, and six from stage three, are reacted with three oxygen molecules. This makes six water molecules and 32 ATPs. Neither of these products is used for anything else. So they are final products as well. The last band, white represents the results of these four stages. First, let's think of what had to be put into the four stages to get them to work. Glycolysis, stage one, required the input of one glucose molecule. The Krebs cycle, 
Stage three required the input of three oxygen molecules and the electron transport system, stage four, required the input of an additional three oxygen molecules. That's it. Thus, the whole process requires one glucose molecule and six oxygen molecules. Remember, coenzyme A used in stage two is not a part of the required input for this process since it comes from the aerobic respiration of a previous glucose molecule. What do we get out of the process? Well, glycolysis stage one gives us two ATPs, the formation of acetylcoenzyme A, stage two, gives us two carbon dioxide molecules. The Krebs cycle, stage three, gives us four more carbon dioxide molecules and two more ATPs. And the electron transport system, stage four, gives us six water molecules and 32 more ATPs. Anything else produced in those four stages is used up later on. As a result, the final products are six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, and 36 ATPs. That's what's shown in the final band. When a single molecule goes through all four stages of aerobic cellular respiration then, the cell gains 36 molecules of ATP. Now, although that sounds like a great trade, one glucose for 36 ATPs, it actually isn't as good as it first sounds. Remember, each ATP holds only a small amount of energy. This is necessary so that energy is released to the cell gently. Well, 36 ATPs actually store only about 55% of the energy contained in a glucose molecule. Where does the other 45% go? It makes heat. Although the heat warms the cell, it cannot be used for things like active transport. So in effect, the cell can only use 55% of the energy contained in the glucose. Even though this suddenly doesn't sound very good, it is still great compared to our modern technology. <laughs> For example, a top of the line automobile is only about 20% efficient in converting the energy of its fuel into energy of motion. Thus, although an efficiency of 55% sounds bad, it is significantly better than the best automobile that we can design. This, of course, should not surprise you. After all, the process of cellular respiration was designed and implemented by God. Anything that he produces will always be superior to the best that mankind has to offer. We want to add one final note regarding cellular respiration. Notice that the first stage of the process, glycolysis, uses no oxygen. Thus, it can happen regardless of whether or not oxygen is present. If oxygen levels are very low, glycolysis can at least produce two ATPs from the glucose molecule. At that point, however, the pyruvic acid molecules produced in glycolysis cannot continue in the process we described. Even though the formation of acetylcoenzyme A does not require oxygen, it also does not produce energy. As a result, there's no benefit to the cell if the pyruvic acid molecules continue to that stage. Instead, in anaerobic conditions, 
the cell eventually converts the pyruvic acid into alcohol or lactic acid. This is called cellular fermentation. And in anaerobic conditions, it is the only option available to cells that are designed for aerobic respiration. Now, think about what you've learned for a moment. Every cell in nature must undergo either aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, which we have not covered here, or cellular fermentation. Obviously, cellular respiration is an incredibly complex process as evidenced by the fact that it is so difficult to understand. This process, however, is just one of the many processes that occur constantly in a cell. This should re-emphasize the point that there is no such thing as a simple organism. Even a single cell is a marvel of complexity because it was designed by a marvelous God. Well, that ends chapter six, module six. I'll see you next time for module seven. God bless you.